The human world has only ever known perpetual war. Since we climbed down from the trees, we've been throwing things at each other. And right now, we're seeing destructive weapons being created that come straight out of a dystopian novel. This is how we got here. Number 10. You've all heard of napalm, but did you know many centuries ago, the Byzantine Greeks had something quite similar, what we now call Greek fire. Historians say this napalm-esque weapon was likely created in the year 672, and by God did it scare the hell out of anyone that stood in the way. Imagine standing across from someone who was firing an ignited petroleum-based liquid at you out of an ancient version of a flamethrower. This was about as high-tech as weapons got back then. Opposing armies hated it, and they had no idea how the Byzantine Greeks had created a fire that just wouldn't go out. It even stayed alight when it hit the water, which was very useful in naval battles. The recipe for the substance was such a closely guarded state secret that enemy militaries would spend years trying to create something that had the same effect, but their efforts usually would amount to nothing. Even now, historians aren't sure what those tricky Byzantines used to set the ocean on fire. However, it's speculated that pine resin, sulfur, quicklime, or a flammable liquid called naphtha could have been involved. Thermal weapons like Greek fire really took off in the centuries that followed. Machines were used to launch objects covered in certain sticky substances, and entire towns could be set alight in a matter of hours. This led to what in modern terms we call a scorched earth strategy. Over the centuries, the machines that launched these projectiles became more advanced, as you probably know from watching various TV shows. It's one of the main reasons why the Byzantine Greeks managed to repel the Muslim armies and navies when they were trying to protect the city of Constantinople. Later in the 13th century, those pesky Christian crusaders were wreaking havoc in Muslim territories. The crusaders came up against a kind of Greek fire, and quite literally could not believe their eyes. Just to give you an idea of how they felt, here's some text from a memoir that was written after the Seventh Crusade. The tail of fire that trailed behind it was as big as a great spear, and it made such a noise as it came that sounded like the thunder of heaven. It looked like a dragon flying through the air. Such a bright light did it cast, that one could see all over the camp as though it were day. We should also mention the trebuchet. If you were attempting a siege and wanted to bash down some castle walls or set fire to the grounds, the trebuchet came in handy. Usually a counterweight would be used with a sling to send a projectile hurling through the air. The Chinese had been using trebuchets since the 4th century BC, and the Byzantines employed them much later when they were experimenting with Greek fire. It wasn't until the 1500s that they went out of fashion, and that's because some of the weapons we'll talk about soon were invented. So, when it comes to deadly weapons of the past, there was perhaps nothing comparable to Greek fire. It was, in fact, your ancient version of a nuclear bomb. We'll talk about those things later too, but first, you need to know just how impactful smaller weapons were. Number 9. If we told you that the bayonet was once the bee's knees of weapons, some of you might think we need to hire new researchers. They certainly don't sound scary, but they changed everything regarding close combat fighting. Imagine you were an English infantryman fighting in the Scottish Highlands back in the day. You took one shot with your musket and then had to go through that irksome few minutes to reload your weapon. As you were doing that, one of the most frightening axe-wielding soldiers you could imagine came at you swinging with abandon. Your chances of survival would be much better if you had a knife on the end of your gun. We get the name bayonet because the French started making them in the 17th century in the town of Bayonne, although the Chinese had something close to a bayonet many years earlier. Back to those formidable Scottish Highlanders. They were roundly defeated by a Jacobite army in 1689 at the Battle of Killiecranky. As was usually the case, the Scots fired their muskets and then ran to the line of opposing soldiers with their swords and axes swinging. But a surprise was in store for them this time. Their enemy had plug bayonets attached to their guns. Still, the Jacobites lost many men. With those particular bayonets, once the blade was attached to the weapon, it could no longer be fired. The soldiers were also unfamiliar with the weapon, so they got an axe to the brain while fiddling around. Bayonets were used with more success during the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. They were used with less success when British soldiers were ordered to leave their trenches and run into no man's land during that bloodbath we called the First World War. They didn't stand a chance with only a bayonet in their hand. Those hooty British commanders, meanwhile, were moving pieces around in what looked like a game of risk. The over-the-top maneuvers were an absolute disgrace regarding military strategy. Soldiers were just about always torn to ribbons by enemy gunfire joining a heap of rotting bodies from previous charges. Back home, the press talked about heroes and clever generals. Here's a quote from the controversial writer and World War I survivor Louis Ferdinand Céline. The poetry of heroism appeals irresistibly to those who don't go to war, and even more to those whom the war is making enormously wealthy. Céline said some terrible things later in life, but it's hard to impugn him for that quote. And if the guns didn't get him, the chemical weapons did. So let's talk about those things. Number 8. 
For all the right reasons, chemical weapons are frowned upon. While it seems paradoxical to say this, when it comes to mass murder during wars, there are always ethical concerns regarding how you can kill someone. If you think about it, chemical weapons use goes back to ancient times. We're sure you've all heard about those ancient Greeks firing poison tip arrows at their enemies. You might not have heard about how the Chinese used pumps to cover their enemies in toxic smoke as far back as the 2nd century BC. Many substances were used, with arsenic being mentioned in ancient texts. When the Romans were scrapping with the Persians, the Persians used sulfur dioxide to kill Roman soldiers. In the 13th century, when King Henry III was the head of England, his navy used something called quicklime to blind the French. Documents describe how the English threw lime mortars onto French ships. Even deadly nightshade was used in battle a few centuries ago, but some people aired their concerns saying toxic chemicals are just not ethical. And that's why, in the Strasbourg Agreement of 1675, the French and the Holy Roman Empire agreed to stop using toxic gases and poisoned bullets. This was the first ever treaty banning the use of chemical weapons. But as you know, this didn't stop militaries from using them. And scientists got smarter during the Industrial Age. The weapons got more deadly. This is when chemical weapons became indispensable, when countries worldwide began experimenting with utterly atrocious weapons. During World War I, chlorine phosgene gas was a favorite. It probably killed in the region of 85,000 people in the war choking them to death in what must have been one of the worst ways to die. Soon, most countries started stockpiling the stuff due to its effectiveness. The Japanese used it at their Unit 731, the place where some very ugly experiments went on. Mustard gas was also a favorite of World War I. It probably killed about 100,000 people, burning their skin, getting into their lungs, blinding them, and causing all manner of deadly infections. Even if a victim did survive, the injuries were often horrifying. It was very easy to contaminate an area, too. During World War I, soldiers often took mustard gas back into the trench in the mud that collected on their boots and uniforms. Suddenly, the entire trench was saying their skin was on fire. Every side was soon using chemical weapons, and back home in laboratories, scientists tried to come up with even deadlier gases. In World War II, an American supply ship was hit while traveling off the coast of Italy. Aboard that ship were 2,000 shells of mustard gas. Around 60 U.S. personnel died, as did an unknown number of Italian civilians. For sure, there was the Geneva Protocol, an agreement not to use such weapons, but that piece of paper might have well been used to wrap up a visit to the toilet. The Nazis exterminated millions of people with gases, but make no mistake, the British and the Americans were also very familiar with using gases and nerve agents. After the war, both the US and UK performed some very sketchy tests with nerve agents. It was only discovered in 2004 that a British soldier named Ronald Madison died from sarin gas tests. In 1953, after signing up for a secret experiment and exposing himself to sarin, he complained that he couldn't hear. Then he collapsed, convulsed, and later died. The tragedy was covered up only for the military to be accused of gross negligence decades later. One can't underestimate how effective a silent but deadly weapon is. Over the decades, most countries have spent a lot of money on developing chemical weapons despite the public hearing how stockpiles keep getting destroyed. Perhaps the latest chemical weapon is something we've never heard of. To be honest, before we started writing this show, we never heard of BZ or Substance 78 to the Russians. This is a colorless and odorless substance that if you ate with your cornflakes, you'd suddenly start tripping out of your mind and be unable to perform the most basic tasks. You might not die, but as one expert put it, you become mad as a hatter, red as a beet, dry as a bone, and blind as a bat. Most warring nations have it or have something similar, and you can bet they have something worse. Chemical weapons suck but they are here to stay. This next weapon is all but gone, but man, was it efficient in its heyday. Number 7. On August 26, 1346, about 10,000 English soldiers went up against around 40,000 to 50,000 French soldiers at the Battle of Crecy in northern France. With those kind of numbers, you wouldn't have put your money on the English. But fast forward a few hours and the battlefield was covered mostly in dead Frenchmen. The French kept on fighting only to find that they were now in a losing battle. The ensuing carnage was described as murderous, without pity, cruel, and very horrible. The numbers differ regarding how many men the English lost, with historians saying it was between 50 and 300. The French lost between 4,000 and 10,000 men, many of them noblemen. What the hell happened? Well, it's a long story, but historians say the primary reason for this military humiliation is the fact that the English had longbows and excellent archers. You might have heard a story about why the English give two-fingered salutes rather than one finger when saying F you. The story states it's because of the wars with the French. You see, the English armies were renowned for their archers. So when the French caught them, they sliced the English guy's trigger fingers off. That's why English archers would show you their two fingers in battle. 
a kind of F you to the French. We might also call it a pluck you. It's a nice story, but we can't say for sure that it's true. Nonetheless, we found a book that states the origin of the gesture derives from the appearance of the longbow toward the end of the 13th century. The longbow, which soon became the standard armament of English infantry, was a weapon of tremendous accuracy and power. An English archer was expected to be able to hit a person-sized target more than 200 yards. True or not, the English did have really talented archers. Bows and arrows had been around forever, but it's the fact that the English perfected making very strong longbows that made them such an advantage in battle. We still don't know who invented this top-shelf kind of longbow, but that doesn't matter to us. What matters is this weapon was very impressive. It was about as good as anything you could arm a single soldier with before the days when they started firing guns. Number 6. In China, sometime in the 9th century, a bunch of alchemists started experimenting with sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate. And what they invented was gunpowder. It was soon discovered that by igniting this stuff, you could make a projectile move at high speed, as Mongol invaders soon found out when they went up against Chinese armies. In the 12th century, these Chinese already had what the English call a cannon. In the 13th century, they had hand cannons, which were effectively very heavy guns. The word spread, and by the time the 14th century ended, there were cannons all over Eurasia. Then, the Western Europeans got hold of them and carnage followed. Longbows and Greek fire were one thing, but cannons were another. On September 7, 1695, Henry Every, aka the King of the Pirates, did something no one thought he could do. His ship attacked a 25-ship convoy of Grand Mughal ships. These were carrying about as much precious cargo as one could imagine. The event went down in history. How could an upstart pirate with a bunch of thugs take what they wanted from people who were the world's wealthiest folks at the time? The answer is Every had stolen a top-notch ship named Charles II. The Mughal ship had 62 cannons itself, but it wasn't as fast, so Every was able to hit first. A cannonball caused a considerable explosion aboard the Mughal vessel. Before you could say shiver me timbers, the pirates were on board the opposing ship doing some very awful things to its occupants. The attack was later romanticized, but make no mistake, those pirates were nasty, especially to the female passengers. Lest we forget, conflicts should never be romanticized, death is never pretty. Just from that attack, Every's men got over a hundred million dollars in today's money, not to mention all the gold and jewels they stole. Whoever had the best cannons was in control of the high seas, another reason why a tiny island called Britain gained so much control over the rest of the world. Now militaries didn't have just longbows and fire, they were also able to knock down walls of castles much more quickly with heavy balls of iron. The cannon stayed in use for centuries, but a more deadly iteration would come onto the scene much later. Also, that hand cannon we just mentioned evolved into a gun, so we also need to talk about the gun. Number 5. As you know, the Chinese invented gunpowder, and it wasn't long until they had hand cannons. These things looked advanced back in the 13th century, but let's face it, you'd struggle to hit a bus from 50 yards with one. Muskets were a significant improvement. They were introduced in the 16th century, and suddenly warfare started to look somewhat different. They could penetrate steel armor. They could quickly kill a man. They were clumsy things, but not as clumsy as a big bow and arrow. But we'll move on from the musket and talk about rifles. You might wonder what the difference is, and it's true, they are quite similar. You loaded them down the muzzle, packed them, took aim, and boom. Then you hoped you'd hit something, because reloading was time consuming. The rifle was just more accurate than the musket because it had rifling grooves. The word rifle comes from scratch or groove, which is why the weapon got the name the rifle. Muskets and cannons were initially smooth bore, meaning they had no grooves inside the barrels. Just imagine that little ball of steel shooting down a smooth chamber. It was chaotic, and that's why the bullet usually wasn't very accurate. Those grooves changed everything. Hitting someone at 50 yards with a musket was a toss-up. Hitting someone at 100 yards was damn hard. Farther than that, you might as well have aimed for the moon. But with rifles, it wasn't long until some of them were pretty accurate up to 500 yards. This was a game-changer, but better types of guns were just around the corner. What if a soldier could fire an entire volley of bullets from his gun? Number 4. In 1884, a man named Hiram Maxim made that possible and revolutionized warfare. This American-British inventor made the first semi-automatic machine gun. He called it the Maxim gun. You might have seen one in a Hollywood Western movie. A similar gun is used in the movie A Fistful of Dollars. It's not actually a Maxim gun, but it's not too far off either. These things represented mass death, even if you had crappy aim. Just before the Maxim gun came the Gatling gun, but you had to rotate a crank with the Gatling gun making killing folks a bit harder. What they both represented was an era of rapid fire. 
The latter was used during the American Civil War. The former was significantly employed during European conquests of Africa, when one man with one gun could massacre a whole tribe of men armed with nothing but spears and a strong heart. A sad sight indeed. Such was the case on October 25, 1893, when 700 soldiers from the British South African police came under attack. From 6,000 Matabele tribesmen, over 1,500 tribesmen were shot down in no time at all. The Brits lost four men. This attack was part of the First Matabele War. The Matabele force included 80,000 spearmen and 20,000 riflemen. But what could they do against Maxim guns? It was a massacre. One British man who observed the war said he'd never seen anything like that gun, stating the British were mowing them down literally like grass. In another fight, 5,000 Indebele warriors were slain by just 50 British men armed with four Maxim guns. Still, fast forward to 1916 during the Battle of the Somme, 21,000 British men were mowed down like grass by the German version of the Maxim gun, the Maschinengewehr 08. These weapons and similar weapons were soon in the hands of soldiers from many countries. The bodies soon started piling up when men with pistols went up against machines that fired 500 rounds per minute. It wasn't long before something even more insidious hit the world's battlefields. These were fast-firing guns such as the AK-47, created by the Russian inventor and military man Mikhail Kalishnikov. The weapon takes its name from him, and the year it came onto the scene, 1947. They were so damned practical as well as deadly. They didn't jam much either. As military experts have said, the true brilliance of Kalishnikov's invention was its simplicity. This is why armies still use them today. You can pick one up for around 150 bucks in Pakistan, and people on the dark web say they'll ship one to the US for around 3600. With their fully automatic setting, firing 600 rounds per minute, you'd better hope that not too many crazy gun nuts get hold of one. Your hopes might be dashed when you hear the news that reports not long ago said AK-47 sold in record numbers in the US. According to an article in Business Insider talking about where they were made, about 70% of the factory's output is now civilian rifles, up from 50% two years ago. Of the civilian arms, about 40% are exported to the US. Let's now turn to one of the heavyweights in the history of weapons. Number 3. With soldiers being armed with powerful weapons and little bombs that could be launched with the swing of an arm, what was now needed was a kind of vehicle that could take a hit and trudge through a battlefield of ditches and mud. This is why the tank appeared on the scene. You might not be surprised to hear that those warring British folks came up with the first tank that loosely resembled a modern tank. On September 6, 1915, something called Little Willie rolled off a production line. It might have only moved at 2 miles per hour, but Little Willie was an instant hit with people who kill for a living. It was built to take a lot of damage and could cross very difficult terrain because it had those tracks that looked a bit like a conveyor belt. Needless to say, after it made its first appearance at the Battle of Soma in the First World War, all warring nations wanted one. No man's land, no problem. You could set one of these things off and it could travel through a hail of bullets, which was somewhat better than sending men over the top shouting "Ah!" armed with only a bayonet and a photograph of their wife. The great resistance painter and scientist Leonardo da Vinci had actually sketched something that looked like a tank, although it was the British that made the things come to life centuries later. By the time World War II was in full swing, many of the world's most powerful nations had quite impressive tanks. The Russians had the Soviet T-34, the Germans had the Panzer IV and V, the Tiger I and II, and the Stug III. The Americans had the Shermans, the French, the Shah B-1, and the Brits, the Crusader. We might annoy tank enthusiasts if we pick one that was superior, although many folks will tell you it was the German Tigers or the T-34. As experts will tell you, the tanks transformed the battlefield. At the same time, something was going on in the skies. Number 2. To talk about the best combat aircraft would take us hours, so we won't do that in detail. It was during World War II when these things really took off, pun intended. Some of them dropped bombs on targets such as the great US flying machine, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. Some of them had dogfights in the air, such as the British Supermarine Spitfire. Even though planes definitely changed the landscape of war, we're going to move forward in time and talk about something that will significantly impact future wars. We hope there won't be too many, but who knows. Unmanned aerial vehicles, more commonly known as drones, have been around a long time. During World War I, the British had a remote-controlled aerial target drone and the Americans had the Kettering Bug. The Germans had the V-1 Flying Bomb, which you might know as the cute-sounding doodlebug. If you could ask any very old British people if they were cute, they'd tell you hell no. When one of those things flew above you, you just had no idea when its wings would fall off and a torpedo would come flying at you. But they're not as scary as what we have now. 
Modern drones are pure horror shows, and it makes one spine tingle when you think some guy sitting in a control room can say, light them all up, and a bunch of people, sometimes innocent, are what you might call vaporized. To think you can cause so much pain and death by pushing a button in an office on the other side of the world, kill, and then have a sandwich and a cup of coffee from the vending machine. This is why drones are a gray area when we talk about the ethics of war, and just imagine if control over these devices was transferred to artificial intelligence. The US's Predator B combat drone can fly at 50,000 feet and carry a payload of over 1,700 kilograms. They might fly above you with GM-114 Hellfire missiles or GBU-12 Paveway-2 bombs. The General Atomics MQ-20 Avenger is even more advanced, also coming from the USA and it's now being exported to places as far as India. Why does every country want this kind of weapon? A possible answer is coming soon. Flying 50,000 feet in the air, the MQ-20 is a killing machine that can be armed with a whole host of next-generation sensors and weapons. Of course, the US isn't the only nation developing such super weapons, so the future of warfare could consist of what looks like people playing video games, except those 92% burns, the limbs lost, the families torn apart, and the brains mushed are very much real. Add to that the fact that many drones miss their targets or hit their targets and take out a lot of innocent folks, it's all just very dark. As a drone operator, you're removed from the pain and the bloodshed, but that hasn't stopped what's now called a drone arms race. Sure, just as more advanced drones take to the skies, more advanced anti-drone defense systems come to life, but where does it all stop? In George Orwell's brilliant 1949 dystopian novel 1984, he wrote about a future in which a Big Brother government rules with omnipresent surveillance that's already pretty much here in the digital age. He also wrote that the future of warfare would have limited aims between combatants who are unable to destroy one another, have no material cause for fighting, and are not divided by any genuine ideological difference. The book says nations are fighting with each other just to prop up their military-industrial complexes and to keep the people in a constant state of fear. That way, they are more controllable. Hence Big Brother's part slogan, War is Peace. This perpetual war he talks about will be led by advanced mechanized machines that cause just enough damage. He says these smaller conflicts will be easier to stomach for the populaces. The individual will be stamped out. People will be so scared that they'll forget about poverty and the poor, who will be left to do their own thing in the eternally dilapidated habitats. People will forget about their own desires and will learn to hate anyone who thinks differently, especially those who embrace human liberties. A militarized police will take care of them once their neighbors have reported them. Orwell talks a lot about scarcity. Even though technological advances could easily feed the planet, everything will become mechanized, but the aim of all this industry is not peace, but more war. He talks about floating fortresses, which the public never really knows much about. They're like modern-day aircraft carriers. The public knows they cost a lot of money, more so because the enemy keeps inventing their own new machines. Orwell writes, in principle, the war effort is always so planned as to eat up any surplus that might exist after meeting the bare needs of the population. The enemy is vague, but it's always there. The only language you're allowed to use is a language that expresses hatred for the enemy and pride for the government. This is made known during Hate Week. Orwell saw the future of drones. In the book, the Ministry of Peace has airplanes that move independent of their base. There will be death, but nothing on the scale of a world war. The people wouldn't like that. And so with these advanced machines, war will be everlasting and without victory. So, in Orwell's imagined world, some high-tech machine like a drone might drop a bomb occasionally, scaring the hell out of people. He called these rocket bombs. In one scene, one of those drones hits a poor neighborhood. Orwell writes, The bomb had demolished a group of houses 200 meters up the street. A black plume of smoke hung in the sky, and below it a cloud of plaster dust in which a crowd was already forming around the ruins. No one knows where it came from, but within minutes, the sordid swarming life of the streets was going on as though nothing had happened. Is this the future? That's bad, but in 1984 people put up with it because they didn't want to think about what would happen if nuclear bombs were dropped on them. Number 1. Orwell wrote, Technological progress only happens when its products can in some way be used for the diminution of human liberty. One thing that governments need to uphold this state of constant war is the threat of something so destructive that people will embrace perpetual minor wars. The threat is nuclear war. Today we have enough nuclear weapons to possibly destroy the world. If all of them were dropped and a nuclear winter followed, there would be hell on Earth. Just imagine if the Tsar Bomba, tested by the Soviets in 1961, fell on your town. The thing carried 50 to 58 megatons of TNT. Hiroshima's little boy bomb was about 13 to 18 megatons, and Nagasaki's Fat Man 19 to 23 megatons. Mutually assured destruction is indeed mad. 
because a nuclear holocaust is possible. As of 2022, Russia has 4,477 nuclear warheads, or 6,000 if the retired ones are included. The US has about 5,500 warheads, with 3,800 of those ready to go. The UK, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea also have a stockpile of nuclear bombs. As we speak, some people are talking about a possible nuclear war due to what's going on in Ukraine. It's hard to believe that any country would choose to launch a bomb and thus set off something so devastating humans would die on an unimaginable scale. Still, as Orwell said, the fact that those bombs are there just means we'll have to put up with endless smaller wars and perpetual expensive conflicts. Therefore, the greatest weapon in the world is ignorance, perhaps after apathy. Now you need to watch The Only Man to Survive Two Nuclear Bombs, 